and hello everyone welcome back to a new video so today we'll be looking at at a lot of things uh, mostly just processing in godot and before we get to coding because we will be doing some coding but before we get to that i need to explain the game loop and delta time so first of all the game loop now a game loop is a loop so if you are familiar with programming a loop is just something that continuously runs until it meets a point in this case it's a while loop so it will just run forever until it spots so basically while the game is running so while game uh, dot run i can't okay okay so let's try to do this so while game dot run it should do the following first of all it should update what has been because remember if we're working with sprites or with images or anything like that it needs to especially if the image is going to change like moving because moving images are basically one image so for example if we have a fish then let's say in the first one its eyes is open but its animation should basically close its eyes so in this case we could just go and create another image of the fish but this time with closed eyes basically when it updates the game it should swap between these two we're, we're not going to get into actually swapping them i'm just showing you how how it should update you know it should update where the character is what it's swapping all of those things so first of all it should update okay i should stick with just text update so that is the first. Once it has updated the everything, it should actually draw those updates to the screen so the user can see them. So to draw. Once it has drawn the update to the screen, then it can start the loop again. So it's going to run this, right? And then once it gets to two, it's going to go back and start the loop again. So while the game is running, it's going to do that. Godot already builds that, has already built that in for us, so we don't have to worry too much about that, but it's still good to know what's going on behind the scenes, what we're actually doing, what's the process function doing. Now that we know what the, what the game loop is, we can talk about frames and delta time. So this right here, that is equal to one frame. So one uh, frame, it's just F, it's not FPS. So if you have 60 FPS, it's running this right here 60 times a second. So because frames per second FPS, for in case you didn't know. So then we'll run that every time the game, every time the loop goes. So 60 times a second, that's 60 FPS. And this is one frame. So now that we know that that is one frame, let's say we have a character. So right here, we have a character. And this character, this player, he wants to get to this chest. Because this chest is full of gold, and we want the gold. Now, when did this character moves to get to this gold right here? It should, no matter what the FPS is, it should take the same time to get from here all the way to there it should take the same time it shouldn't really differ some games it does benefit to differ but a lot of times it's just good to have him move at the same time you know for example take multiplayer games if some of the characters move faster because they have better fps than you did would that be fair for, take a racing game for example if the guy that had more fps in the multiplayer game drove faster because he had more fps would that be fair to you no, that would not. You you would still want to get to this finish line right here in exactly the same time the other guy would, no matter if your FPS is half of his FPS. So that is kind of how this is going how delta time is going to help us here. So delta time is basically the time passed between this frame and the previous frame. So let's say the the this the time passed between frame one and frame two is let's say 0 0.016 seconds. Now, 0 0.016 seconds is basically 
one frame in 60 frames per second. So, yeah, that, let's say that's the time passed. And that is the delta time. We can use this to calculate how much a, someone should move. So let's say the player should move the movement speed. So this is the player's location. Let's make that an L. Let's just, just imagine that's an L. So that's an L. The location of the player is the movement of the player. So let's say it's 1 plus delta. So plus delta. Delta you will also see as in triangle if you are into complex mathematical functions. Delta is also the triangle. But anyways, so that is kind of how you get the delta movement. I'm not going to go too deep into this because Godot gives us delta. I just want you to know what's going on behind the scenes with delta. So this right here, this path, it's basically split into, let's actually make this red. It's basically split into different frames, we could say, as how the character moves. And let's imagine this is 60 frames right here. Okay, so let's imagine there's just six, just, just ignore the not equal spacing. Let's imagine all of these are 10 frames. I'm not going to draw 60, but, you know, just as a, an example. Now, when the player moves, let's say 60 frames per second, it should get from this frame to that frame. In, because this is, these are 10 frames, so it would be 0 0.016 times 10. But let, let's imagine for a second you're running on 6 frames per second. But it should move from here to here in 0 0.016 seconds. If, that, if these are 2 frames, frame 1 and frame 2. Same here, 0 0.16 seconds. But this is if it runs at 60 frames per second. So imagine these are just 1 frame per second, not 10, just 1. But that's 60 frames per second, and that is good if you're on a 60 frames per second machine, but what if your machine isn't powerful enough? What if it runs on 30 frames per second? Well, then this shouldn't be drawn. This middle one right here shouldn't be drawn, because remember, if this only runs 30 frames per second and no longer 60 frames per second, it has less time to update. It only has half the time to update and half the time to draw because it's running at half the speed because 30 frames per second is less than 60. So then it's going to basically skip one and go to the next one. It, it should actually be this one. Just make just think of it as this one. So then this is 30 frames per second. So that's a basic concept of what's happening. So even though, let's say this, this right here, that, this movement, just go like that because I don't have any more space. Let's say that takes one second. Just as an example. Then if you're on 60 frames per second, then every half second you'll get a frame. But on 30 frames per second, you'll get one frame. So just as an example, don't get too confused here. I just need to, you to know the basics. In fact, if you are struggling with some game mathematics, here's a playlist. Hopefully I will remember to put the link in the description, but they have a lot of great videos on this and especially this one right here. This explains amazing in an amazing way how delta time and game loops and all of those things works. So if you are still confused on how this is supposed to work, how it's supposed to move from one frames and all of those, go check that out. The main concept here is this right here. The player shouldn't move faster if it's on 60 frames per second or on 30. The, just, just the amount of times it's getting, getting drawn, that's the only time that, that it will kind of affect it. So if it's being drawn on 30 frames per second, you'll see that it's having, you'll see less updates as it happens. If it's on 60 frames per second, more updates will happen instantly. But the player should still move the same distance no matter what this right here is. No matter what the frames is. So even if it's one frame per second, that just means it's going to have to jump all the way to there because it's just one frame per second. Let's say this takes a second right here. Then, you know, it will do that since so it's one frame per second. But yeah, I'm little, enough of that. I might be confusing you, but if it didn't, good job staying, staying here. Okay, so let's get into coding and all of those things because now that we know what's happening in the background, we can kind of understand what is going on. Let's create a label. 
So to create a label, we could just go here and say label. And here we have a label, nothing too special. So we can give it a script. So let's go right here, it's an attached script. And we can just call label.gd, it's not that important. So here we have it. Here we have our template code, we can just delete all of that, but that we won't need. No program need ready either. But anyways, to get this, the, what we just talked about to work, we have to create a function, so func, and we're going to say underscore process. And as you can see, it also completed that for me, and it already calculated delta. Remember, delta is the time between the last frame and this frame. It already calculates that. It's a variable inside of Godot. That's really nice, and you will notice that once you really get to bigger games. Now, this underscore process function right here, it doesn't have a set frame rate, which means it changes its frame rate depending on the computer. Can the computer run this? That is what happens. It, it, it changes between 60 and 30 and all of that. And its execution is done basically after the physics step on a single threaded game, of course. Now, if a physics step is basically a physics process, it's the same as this process right here, but it's a little bit different. First of all, it is basically set at 60 frames per second by default. You can change that later, which we might be getting to later on a bit. It is basically physics, like controlling your character. And so this basically does all the processing after you've controlled your character and all of those things. So it's, it's kind of a go-to thing. We'll get into that later, but for right now we only need to know about the underscore process. We can create a variable and we can call it a c c u a zero. Now, if you haven't talked about variables, basically they're just containers. So you know you can put something inside of them. In this case, we're putting a zero here. It's like it's like math. You know, in math class you used to do something like. That is how you used to do in math, right? Here is the other, the other way around. We get x. We set x right here. No, not there. We set x. And then we can use x later on. So we know what x is, and that's kind of how it's working. We set the variables. We don't have to figure out what it is. So in this case, accum is now equal to 0. So let's go and say accum. And we can say plus equal delta. Now, this can also be written as accum is equal to accum plus delta. But since we mostly don't want to rewrite this entire thing, because sometimes variables can become quite long and tedious to write, we can just do this, say plus equal, and we'll do the same thing. And then we can just say text is equal to string accum. So if we were to just save this and run it, as you can see there, it changes constantly. So what did we do? What math did we just pull out here? I don't know if you can see that. I'll zoom into that. But anyways, what math did we just do here? Basically, we got the accumulated time. That's what ACCUM was. It's the accumulated time. We set it to zero because if you don't set a variable first, then you might get a few errors. We set it outside of process because remember, this process is being run in a loop, which means if we set it here to zero, it's going to start at zero each and every time. We don't want that. But basically, then we just take the text, and this text is built into the label. So when we created a label node and we gave it a script, once we say text, it basically allowed us to just instantly set the text of this label. So it's a built-in variable specifically for labels. So you remember if you go to the, you click here, and we go here, then as you can see, text is right there. We basically change that. Okay, so then we just turned into a string because text has, kind of has to be a string, you can't just put an integer in there. The, it's called data types. I haven't talked about it in this tutorial or any of the ones before, but basically data types in a sense, because we're not going to get too deep into it right now. We get different types of data types. We get integers, which is just numbers like one, two, three, four, five. Floats or doubles, which are basically 1.1, 3.14, basically numbers that can have floating point values. 
booleans, which is true or false. Strings, which is text, so hello, goodbye. And then we have chars, which is basically one character or one number. String, in this case, is just text. So we're taking this and we're, t and we're going from a number, because as you can see, it's zero. And we're changing it into uh, this. And so if we run it again, this might be a little confusing, but we don't have to focus too much on this right now. We just need to know how it works. We just have to understand the background. But as you can see, there we go. So that's just the process. I'm not going to go too deep into it yet because we will be focusing more on this later. But for right now, I don't think we have to. But thank you all for watching. I hope you all enjoyed and did understand. And see you all again in the next video.